Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying Sasquatch encounters. Now, before I start, I want to let you know that on this channel, I like to share encounters that are more of a slow boil, that tend to create an atmosphere and a mood. If you're a fan of encounters like this, be sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notifications. I post new videos every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and if you have your notifications on, you'll be the first to know when those videos go live. All right, let's get right into it. It was the middle of the first week of November, and Kong had not appeared for a few days. The Diggins seemed lifeless without him, as I walked the newly blazed road around the property. It was early afternoon, and I carried my machete with which I cut brambles or limbs that protruded onto the road. As I cut away a few brambles, I looked down and saw two spent shotgun shells. Suddenly, it dawned on me hunting season had begun in Pennsylvania. My thoughts were of Kong. I had to get him out of this populated area. Even though no one bothered me in the middle of my woods, at least they didn't bother me while I was there. The border of the property was posted with signs of no trespassing and no hunting. My cabin was burglarized, but these elusive beings did not frequent the area when I was about. The side of the cabin was peppered with buckshot the first year. It was built and, since that time, there were hunters, but never while I was there. My cabin was in the midst of a large hunting population, and in November, the roads and hillsides of the area were dotted with red, brown, and orange-clad men followed by yelping dogs. Pennsylvania sold more hunting licenses than any other state last year, and it is truly a hunter's paradise, teeming with all sorts of games. What could I do to protect Kong? I mulled over the situation and wondered if the hunters would obey my no hunting signs, but already there were spent cartridges lying about. The urge to kill something must be innate in humans. I remember my encounter with the 13-year-old boy who stopped by my pond one day. After our initial approaches and getting acquainted, he indulged me with stories of his killing prowess. Even though it's illegal for a boy his age to possess a firearm in our state without being accompanied by an adult, he claimed his mother had just bought him a $75 shotgun for his 13th birthday. With this weapon, he succeeded in knocking off hundreds of crows, some groundhogs, raccoons, squirrels, rabbits, and possums. With each species blasted, he was able to relate somewhat interesting stories of their demise. I asked the kid why he did it, and all he could say was that it was fun. At the time, I hoped that this was just juvenile bragging, but the kid had a real knowledge of the hunting experience, and I credited him with at least half of his kills. He would probably grow up to be a professor of zoology like Barney. My brother-in-law hunts groundhogs each summer and leaves them lie where he shoots them. It's hard on the groundhog, but the carcasses do return to nature, that which it took from nature, just as yours and mine will. As the boy and I continued to talk, a hawk flew over, and the boy made a motion as if he were raising an imaginary rifle to blast it. Bang, he shouted. I tried to get him by saying that if he killed the hawk, it would be a split second of satisfaction to him, and the hawk would be gone forever from the earth. It would be a living thing destroyed, never to return. He countered by saying that he knew a place in eastern Pennsylvania where millions of hawks passed through each year, and someday he was going to go there with his dad. The boy came around about a week or two after our first encounter and asked if he could spear some frogs, and when I refused, he went away. I did find some frog remains around the pool a few weeks after that, which I attributed to him, but had no proof of his involvement. He must be a pretty big kid now, and I hope his itchy trigger finger has been satisfied and he has taken up other pursuits. My plan was to lure Kong into my car and transport him to a less populated area that was at all possible. I had two remote areas in mind. There was the various wilderness areas of West Virginia and the northern forest area of central Pennsylvania. 
either one of these would serve to hide him from the hunting population. The fact that he had survived all these years did not enter my mind. Northern Pennsylvania contains the only national forest east of the Mississippi River. It is a large area covering most of four counties. It prides itself on its virgin timber, and the fact that it is the only national forest to show a continuous profit from its management skills. First, I had to see Kong again. A thought flashed through my mind that he may even be shot now, but it would have made the papers if this were so. He was still around, and it would now take patience to see him with so many people out in the wilds this time of year. I returned home and told Sally that I was lecturing to a conservation group that evening and I would not be home for supper and would probably return home around midnight. She reminded me that she still did not trust me and asked me for more information. I made it up as I went along. I told her that there would be a dinner for the group at the Holiday Inn in the county seat of Washington, Pennsylvania, and I was the main speaker. I did identify the group and didn't go into the lecture topic too clearly since it was a complicated title but would tell her all about it when I returned home. She appeared to accept this. As late afternoon approached, I waited for Kong with much nervousness. I was extremely relieved when he did appear. The sun was sinking rapidly, emitting a red glow, which framed the approaching Kong in the horizon, visible through the naked tree trunks. I greeted Kong by touching him and handed him an apple, which he quickly devoured. To complete my lure, I put apples up front in the wagon and told Kong to get them. He had never been in the car before and leaned over to get the apples from the rear without actually getting in. I picked up his feet. He was heavy and pushed him into the rear. He resisted a little and helped by stooping down further and following my pushing lead, moved his body to the front where the apples were. Once I had him inside, I closed the tailgate and went around to the driver's seat. Kong panicked when I slammed the door and started the electric rear window winding upward. He began screaming and clawing wildly at the upholstery, tearing huge chunks of it away. I put my hand back to stop him, but he caught my hand with his wrist and swung wildly. The pain shot all the way to my shoulder, but my hand and arm was not broken, just bruised. I yelled at Kong to stay but he continued whacking away at the rear of the wagon. I was hoping that he didn't get his body set where he could leverage. Finally, when I turned the car to back around, he was thrown flat to the front. I said lie as loudly as I could. The word exploded from my lips. Kong, momentarily stunned, rolled over on his back with his head toward the front seat. I put my hand on the top of his head and started the car. He whimpered, but I kept my right hand on him and clumsily drove the car with my left hand, the wrist of which was aching. I believe it was the initial trust that I'd built up with Kong which made him quiet and accept the ride. After about an hour, the stars came out and Kong settled. I could take my hand from him, but I kept a quiet low patter of conversation. Kong watched the stars fly by as I headed the car north up towards the New York border. There was wild country up there that I had known many years ago. There were several nice places to choose from. There was the Cook State Forest, which had a large variety of hemlocks and oaks. There was the Allahanny National Forest that had smaller trees, but very few tourists and settlements. This was the place upon which I had decided to release Kong. Here lived deer and black bear and a host of lesser animals. The only known Lobo Timber wolves were in cages near a town called Kane. This was the icebox of Pennsylvania. Deep, remote woodlands, surely Kong would be safe there. The trip was uneventful except for my apprehension. Kong traveled well, and I was able to keep my hand from him in the dark areas, but when I had to drive through a small town, he would whimper, and I would put my hand on him as we went under streetlights and along lighted yards. I finally arrived at my destination, a secondary road halfway between the towns of Pigeon and Lynch in the heart of the Allahanny National Forest. The area was slightly southwest of Bradford, which was one of the larger oil towns of this remote Northland. I stopped the car, rolled down the rear window while Kong whimpered. I opened the tailgate. I called to Kong to go. He stepped out of the wagon and approached me as I backed off. I made the gestures and shouted go, but he just stood there. 
As one would abandon a dog, I jumped into the car, tailgate still down, started the motor, peeled out spinning tires, and drove away. I got a glimpse of Kong through the rearview mirror and was glad that it was too dark to see his expression. When I returned home, about an hour after midnight, Sally was waiting for me. You're still running around with that girl, aren't you? Well, I called her parents and told them all about you two. It appeared that somewhere, some poor girl was now catching hell from her parents. This was the gist of the conversation for the next 10 or 15 minutes. I denied my guilt and told her she could check my story. She was way ahead of me, for she had driven to Washington and to the Holiday Inn, where the owner had never heard of such a banquet. I tried to put her on the defensive by saying how could I be square with her when she had obviously no trust in me and perhaps I was testing her. She wasn't buying any of that, and what's more, she was now considering divorce. I wondered if Kong was worth the price I had to pay for my association with him. Classes resumed, and the next day, I routinely met my groups, but my lack of enthusiasm was obvious. In the early morning, I called the local newspaper and gave them a news story about my alleged lecture with appropriate quotes from the speech. The man who took the story seemed glad to get it and agreed to have it printed in the afternoon edition. I felt at the time that I was saved. At supper, the paper arrived, and I let Sally read it first. Anticipation rose within me as I watched her read every page out of the corner of my eye. She seemed to take exceptionally long, and I wondered if the article I had called in had made the edition. Sally made no comment about the article, and when she put the paper down, I grabbed it eagerly. The article was there all right, but everything was mixed up. My name was so misspelled that it was not even remotely familiar, and the facts of the speech were so fouled that it was impossible to figure out the nature of the article, let alone the gist of the speech. Some of the facts were near enough, and I pointed this out to Sally. She fumbled around with the paper for a while, and then deftly creased it and tore out the article and took it upstairs, I assume to her files. There was nothing to do but go to the cabin. The atmosphere at home was intense, and few words were spoken. I began to understand such phrases as, the silence hung heavy, and, oh, what a tangled web we weave when we first practice to deceive. I drove mechanically to the Diggins. The lack of sleep was catching up on me. When I arrived at the Diggins, who should be waiting beside the porch but Kong? How did he get back so quickly? He had covered over 200 miles in less than a day. His body reeked of foul sweat, but he appeared happy as I gave him several apples. He flashed much teeth. I don't think he was smiling, but there was flashing teeth, which I hoped was a good sign of good cheer and that he was not planning to bite me. I must admit that I was very happy to see him, and the disturbances at home made me look upon Kong as an old friend. I told him about my situation, and I am certain he didn't understand any of it. I didn't understand any of it either. Let me review what had transpired. Kong had traveled about 200 miles, that as the crow flies, in less than 24 hours for a minimum speed of about 10 miles per hour. He had found his way back from a remote area of Pennsylvania. Perhaps this was his interest in the stars, and perhaps he traveled by them, or he was familiar with the area and had traveled around there many times. After reflecting upon the situation, I decided that Kong could be elusive if he wished and that my fears of his being shot were unfounded. For the rest of November, I heard shotguns and rifles firing within my woods and on my neighboring property. When the hunting season ended and December appeared, Kong was still alive and still coming to the diggings for his ration of apples. Apples were now getting rarer in the markets and I went to an apple cider mill and made a deal for several bushels which were being saved for future processing. I was also given four bushels of pressed apples. When asked why I wanted the pressed apples, I said it was for my compost pile. I tried to get Kong into various activities in order to test his agility, strength, and speed. These did not meet with much success. I would run, but he would not follow. I would break sticks, but he would not. I would throw stones, but he would not. I tried blocking him like a football tackle, but he just stood there without changing his position. I brought him a volleyball, but he just ignored it. When I crowded him and he objected, he would merely shove me away and I would go sprawling. Once I produced a sheet of paper with a pencil, I drew quickly a sketch of Kong with eyes and all as he watched. 
I was rather pleased that he stood for this, and when I handed him the paper to view it closer, he took it, sniffed it, and then ate it. I'm not an artist, but I did make several sketches. None of them met with my satisfaction, but I kept some of them anyways. Kong was just a big hunk of a creature. He did not get angry. He did not get frustrated. If he had desires, he did not communicate them to me. I wondered if he contemplated his creator and his place in the cosmos. Ideas do not seem to be of any value unless they can be communicated to another being. I wished that I could discuss the nature of the universe with Kong, but he was not up to it and the many questions and ideas that I had in mind were of no significance. I reflected on hermits who lived with their dogs and goats and wondered how they satisfied this need to communicate with beings that would understand and feel their frustration of an idea which would never bear fruit. I did have one partial success with discovering how to communicate with Kong. It was a success that could have been devastating had it not come to a conclusion. I had wondered if I could train Kong in doing some useful chores for me. My property was overrun with scrub trees and berry bushes in a section which was once a plowed field and now allowed to grow over. I thought that if I could get Kong to uproot some of the smaller trees, I could clear the section and have a small tract of pasture land available. This would attract a series of open field animals and birds and add the variety of life forms on the property. I walked to the section with Kong one evening, just before sunset. It was not his habit to follow me when I walked away from the cabin area, but if I withheld the apples, I could lure him along for a short distance. I often wondered why he didn't simply take the apples from me. Perhaps he had some sense of ownership. It was getting colder as winter was coming on and the chill of the air was biting. The leaves were gone and the bleakness of the winter sky was in harmony with the bleakness of the vegetation. The wind whipped up the dry leaves underfoot as I and the creature walked along. This was to be an experiment in communication and if I could get my message across I would save myself many hours of work and would have made a giant stride in my relationship with Kong. When we got to the brush area I pulled up a small bush. It did not come out easily, and there was much puffing and straining. I decided to get a smaller bush and told Kong to watch. He didn't know what I meant, and his head rolled from side to side while studying the bush. What I was doing was of no concern to him. I went over to him, took his hand, and led him to a small plant, a crab apple tree about two feet high. I bent the plant over with my feet, pulled Kong's hands down until it reached the base of the tree, and tried to put his fingers around it. He gave me a shove with the other hand and once again sent me sprawling. I let fly a series of curses and went back to him and tried to explain that I wanted the bush torn up and took his hand again and placed it on the bush. He yawned and was unconcerned. I pulled up several more seedlings. Kong started to watch what I was doing. I pulled up a few small wild cherry, hawthorn, crabapple, and black locust trees. After each pulling, I would smooth the disturbed dirt with my feet, put the small bush on a bush pile which was growing fast. After about 15 minutes, Kong came over to where I had smoothed back the dirt and ran his hand through it, turning up a few milk-white grubs. To my surprise, he picked these up and ate them. He went to the other spots which were torn up and did the same thing. These were not as rewarding as the last spot. Perhaps the grubs had a chance to burrow deeper. Kong pulled up a few plants and searched through the roots for grubs. He beat the plants against the ground and went through the materials, which had fallen off. It was getting pretty dark by then, and the things he ate from the refuse, I assume, were grubs. I told Kong that I would see him tomorrow. I don't think he understood tomorrow, but I said a lot of things to him that I don't think he understood. My path back to the cabin was difficult. Kong did not follow me, but stayed behind tearing up small bushes. He seemed to have great night vision and was perfectly comfortable in the failing light. As I arrived back at the cabin the next day, I was pleased with myself for having made a breakthrough with Kong. It was now a matter of time before I could find the method or secret of communication and put him to use. This would be the highest level of exploitation. I would get hard work in return, he would get almost nothing except apples. When I reached the cabin area, I was shocked to see all the low planting and much of the side brush torn up and scattered about. I had created a monster.
much in the pattern of Dr. Frankenstein. How could I now control him? I didn't want the entire I didn't want the entire county torn to shreds. As I viewed the uprooted trees while sitting on the railing of the porch, the sound of a distant motor grew louder. It was a bright orange pickup truck coming up the driveway. As it cleared the trees, I could see it was a West Penn powered company truck. The truck pulled to a stop and a middle-aged man wearing a yellow hard hat and carrying a clipboard jumped out. He walked briskly by me without speaking, went to the side of the cabin and jotted down the reading on the electric meter. As he came back, he was startled and remarked that he didn't, that he didn't even see me and wasn't looking for anyone since he didn't see my car. We exchanged pleasantries, and he finally asked, what the hell happened here? I told him I wasn't sure, and that it was Halloween pranksters. These goddamn kids should all be in jail, and you should see what they do to my truck when I just leave it overnight. With a few more remarks along these lines, he entered the truck, hitting a hard hat along the upper rim of the doorframe, slammed the door, started the vehicle, and whipped it around and gassed it out of sight. Much to my satisfaction, the uprooting of small plants had ceased almost as fast as it had started. Kong had had a one-night binge and then forgot what he had done or preferred not to do it again. I breathed easier the next two days when I found no new areas of uprooting. I had learned a few things from the experience. I would not try to get him to do anything which, he, which might lead to damage again. One of the trees he tore up was a black locust 12 feet high and 4 inches in diameter, measuring 2 feet above the roots. Its top was stunted and probably should have been taller. It was here that I learned Kong did eat grubs, and when I mentioned him digging for grubs earlier in the story, I was not aware that that was what he was actually doing at the time. I mentioned digging for grubs more as a depiction of the scene rather than reality. I wondered if he would eat mature insects, and I was about to set up a test for him. A few days after the tree uprooting, I captured moths in my woodpile and tried to get Kong to eat them, but he refused. He also refused various kinds of larvae, which were under the bark of logs in the woodpile. He did eat a few small black beetles, wings and all, but this did not seem to be of any significance. Humans can, of course, eat almost any insect or larva without having any ill effects. In fact, beetles, ants, bees, and cicadas are nutritious, and if we could get over our prejudices against them, we would find them welcome additions to our diet. I do not want to give the impression that I do not practice what I preach. I have eaten beetles, ants, bees, and cicadas, and that is why I mention them. These are best roasted on an open pan in an oven, and then they take on the consistency of popped corn or cornflakes. I have not been able to bring myself to eat grubs or any other kind of larva. Grasshoppers are plentiful, and I understand that certain peoples of Africa and the Middle East eat them. The American Indians were supposed to have eaten grasshoppers, but I cannot avoid my prejudices, and I have not been able to try to eat them. As a boy, my friends and I slaughtered the grasshopper locusts in large numbers, and the memory of their juices flying will never leave my mind. In communication with Kong, I believed that I was the teacher, and other than curiosity, he had nothing to offer from which I could learn. As I look back at two events, I cannot help but chuckle. The two separate events were indeed lessons in embarrassment and morality. The first episode involved what can loosely be described as bathroom behavior. It was on a warm day, and evening was almost upon us. Kong squatted near the corner of the cabin, and I stood leaning on the side of the building facing him. We stared at each other in our usual manner, when he suddenly broke from the stair, rose, stepped off the side into the high uncut weeds. He reached down and scooped up a hole in the earth about ten feet from me, and squatted higher than usual. From his ass, he extruded a large, solid turd. As this was extruding, he looked at me without expression. After he had finished, he covered the turd with dirt using his hand. Then he came back to squat and stare at me. I remember that my feeling was one of embarrassment watching him. I believe I even looked away. When he returned to a place in front of me, I felt among other emotions besides embarrassment, apologetic. I couldn't explain this emotion. I had been around animals enough all my life and certainly did not have feelings of this nature around them. As young boys growing up in the woods, it was a common practice to crap when the urge was upon us. 
However, after Kong left, I reflected upon my feelings and cursed myself. Why should anyone be embarrassed by defecation? That's a fancy word for shitting. Somewhere in my upbringing, I was led to believe that shitting was unnatural and perhaps there were mortals who did not engage in the practice. Every living creature shits. You, me, the president, the king, the queen, the pope, and all things of the animal world. To conjugate, I shit, you shit, he shits, she sits, we shit, they shit, we have shit, they had shit, and need I go on. It is a natural function, and I cursed myself for having been affronted by it. My scientific curiosity, however, did convince me to dig up the turd the next day and measure it. It consisted mostly of choked cherry seeds. They were bound together by brownish-green matter, which was unidentifiable to me. The turd was partly coiled, so I laid a string upon it and then stretched out the string and measured a length of 14 and 1 quarter inches. It was even 2 inches in diameter at the center position which tapered toward one end. I don't know what this has to do with anything, but that's what happened and those were the measurements. The other event is rather humorous now that I reflect upon it, but at the time some Puritan influence overcame me. Kong had arrived at the cabin with this massive erection. Usually his penis hung limp after a time it ceased to exist. He never urinated around me, so there was no need to dwell upon it. I wondered if he held the penis when he urinated or was it just a release as horses do. When the penis was limp, it seemed to be about an inch in diameter and about six inches long. It looked very human with a red head that occasionally poked out from the foreskin. His testicles were not overtly large but hung to about the same length as the penis. I had the same attitude towards Kong that I had toward other players on the football team as we dressed and undressed for our various practices and games. The big ones and the little ones got some attention for a time, then everyone got around to ignoring the penis and balls and went about their duties for the team. So this was my attitude toward Kong. Well, here was Kong, with a glowing heart on, standing in front of me. I gave him two apples, which he promptly ate. As he stood around, I felt uneasy and, once again, embarrassed. Occasionally, he would touch the end of his penis and seem to be brushing away flies, but none were in evidence. He was not masturbating. Finally, I told him to get the hell out of here and if he had a female to go and find her. Of course, he did not understand what I was saying. Whenever I wanted Kong to go away, I would go into the cabin and pull the curtains closed. He would circle the cabin and look in the windows, but when the curtains were closed, he would usually go away after about a half hour when I didn't try to communicate with him. Often I have reflected on the burglars who stole the first set of curtains and shades from the windows. What would they have thought when they were taking out the furniture if Kong had come upon them? I mused at the thought of training Kong to be a watchman, trained to maim burglars. In my imagination, I pictured him throwing them in every conceivable fashion. Burglars are anonymous creatures, and the thought of them gave me the creeps. But for these imaginary trips, I gave them faces and body builds, and Kong pushed these into various stages of distortion. However, I digress and should get back to the story. Kong finally did go away, and I was relieved. I took up my water jug and walked over to the hill toward the stream and the spring from which I obtained water. My cabin did not have running water and does not to this day have running water. As I approached the bottom of the hill, I could see the cows in the pasture on the other hillside. There was a noisy commotion among the cows. When I put the water jug down and walked over, I could see Kong. He was mounted on a large Holstein cow and was shoving away. The cow would start to walk away and Kong would lift his legs and hang on with his hands cupped against the side of the cow until it would stop and then he would begin working his buttock rapidly. And once again, I was stupidly embarrassed. Kong continued this activity for what seemed to me an interminable length of time, but it was probably about five or six minutes. I walked back to the water jug, picked it up, went to the spring, loaded it up, and returned to the cabin. I was sitting on the porch when Kong returned to the cabin. He was visible in the light rays beaming from the cabin, and I could see his penis dripping, and for the first time, I could detect his breathing. I started hollering at him, and he looked bewildered. He held out his hand for apples. I went into the cabin, got three, gave them to him, and he promptly pushed these into his mouth. I gave him some more hell, and finally asked myself what the hell I was doing. I even threatened that the farmer would shoot him. I began to get some glimpse of the idea of morality. 
Certainly, this act was neither moral nor immoral. It had no bearing on me, him, or eternity. It was just an event that had no significance. Perhaps he felt relieved, and this was a positive good. As if there was such a thing as good or evil, I don't know. All I can conclude is that the event was of no moral significance. Good and evil are concepts that exist only in the mind of the beholder. It did prove that Kong knew of other animals and some use that could be made of them other than food. I told Kong there were no more apples and that he should leave. I headed for the car, and Kong started slowly up the road toward the top of the hill. I hollered after him, you picked the ugliest one. I hope you enjoyed those stories, and if you did, be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. I post new videos every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and if you have your notifications on, you'll be the first to know when those go live. Again, thank you so much for watching the video, and until next time, bye!